Good evening once again, and welcome to the Taubman Center for American Politics and Policy at Brown University. I'm Richard Arenberg, visiting professor of the practice of political science and a senior fellow at the Watson Institute. I'm honored to serve this year as interim director of the Taubman Center, which is part of the Watson Institute. The Taubman Center seeks to impact American politics and policy through scholarship, public opinion polling, conferences, workshops, academic research, internships, and a robust series of speakers drawn from experts, the media, academia, think tanks, and public officials. This year, we've been placing special emphasis on the 2020 national elections and the events which have followed as a new administration and the nation grapple with issues of the public health crisis, social justice, education, the economy, and commitment to the rule of law. Tonight, we present the 30th in our series of programs. We're pleased that large numbers of Brown students, faculty, alumni, and other interested people have been joining us for these events. Tonight, we're fortunate to have with us a panel of distinguished and accomplished Brown faculty members. J. Brian Atwood is a visiting scholar in international and public affairs at the Watson Institute and Professor Emeritus at the University of Minnesota's Hubert H. Humphrey School of Public Affairs. He was administrator of the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, during the Clinton administration. Corey Brett Schneider is professor of political science. His most recent book is The Oath and the Office, A Guide to the Constitution for Future Presidents. Patsy Lewis is director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies and visiting professor of international and public affairs at the Watson Institute. Among other publications, she's the author of Surviving Small Size, Regional Integration in Caribbean Mini States. Wendy Schiller is the Rice Family Professor of Teaching Excellence in Political Science, Professor of International and Public Affairs. She is the Chair of Brown's Political Science Department. Among her numerous books is Electing the Senate, Indirect Democracy Before the 17th Amendment, Recently, she co-edited Dynamics of American Democracy, Partisan Polarization, Political Competition, and Government Performance. Margaret Weir is Wilson Professor of International and Public Affairs and Political Science. She is author and editor of a number of books, including Who Gets What? The New Politics of Insecurity. We'll hear briefly from each of the panelists for an opening thought. And following that, I'll raise a few questions and open things up for discussion among the panel. Following that, we'll welcome questions and comments from the audience. Please type these into the, uh, the Zoom Q&A box. Please keep your questions and comments brief. Provide your name, and if you're a Brown student or alumni, your graduation class, and we'll get to as many questions as possible. This event is being recorded for later viewing, available on the Taubman Center website or the Watson Institute website. It's also being live streamed on YouTube. Let me now turn to the panel and we'll begin tonight with Professor Schiller. You're Welcome, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, I have been trying to think about what we all speak about and, and there's so much that uh, President Biden has attempted to do, is doing. It's one of the most, if not the most energetic uh, first five or you know, basically five months, four months of a presidency that I've seen uh, on all fronts. 
you you sort of think about recent history and you think about the Trump presidency coming in in, in 2017 and you think about the Obama presidency and the Bush presidency. And certainly um, you had some activity levels that look similar, but in terms of Obama, he was faced with such an ec extraordinary economic crisis that everything was either something Bush had started to address the economic woes of the country in the Great Recession or uh, expand it. Uh, but he didn't really have, I think, the momentum or the, the ambition or the opportunity, you could argue, that Biden seems to be both um, experiencing and willing, in other words, wishing that he could get this momentum in his own party and even get bipartisan support. So I think it's, it's uh, uh, there's a sense of urgency, uh, I think, to President Biden's legislative program, to his cabinet nominations, getting everybody confirmed, willing to use majority power in the Senate, uh, particularly in the area of reconciliation that Rich Ehrenberg is an expert on, uh, procedurally to ram things through. You know, it's, it's, he doesn't, you don't have a sense from this president that he's got four years. Even though he has four years, you don't get the sense from Biden that there's any time to waste. And he extends the olive branch on a lot of things. And he's focusing uh, primarily on domestic politics. Obviously, um, uh, other panelists, Patsy Lewis, Brian Network, can talk about foreign policy and trade politics. But he's really been focused on getting the country out of the pandemic, but also really expanding um, you know, a range of government programs that have existed in one form or another and changing the nature of those programs. And he's uh, really been extraordinary in being committed to that agenda and not apologetic for it. And I think the luxury uh, that President Biden has that perhaps well, definitely Obama did not have, even Trump did not have, uh, and Bush did not have, was that it's very hard to demonize Joe Biden. Even in the campaign, Trump ran against him, made fun of him, but it was very difficult to demonize him, make him the topic of conversation and say anything he wants to do, we don't want to do for these reasons. But that's just not been possible to do uh, against Biden in the campaign or now. Um, no matter what you think, people, you know, people have generally decent favorability feelings towards Biden, but even if they don't like everything he's doing, they still like him better than they liked originally Obama, better than they liked originally Trump across the board. So it's very difficult to attack uh, the agenda uh, in sound bites the way you can attack, attack the person. So I think that's something that he's benefited from. I think he's taking advantage of that. I don't know how long that lasts. It could last the entire time of his presidency. Uh, but uh, if the economy does start to pick up, and we've seen some success in vaccinations uh, and he manages or it shows the desire to use majority party strength to do things that benefit people directly where you don't have to explain the benefit they're getting. They get the check or they get the tax credit or they get the actual benefit and they can feel it. Then that will be a, a strong advantage to the Democratic Party and Biden going into 2022. That's a big if, but it seems as though he is willing in some ways even to sort of break minority rule as we've mm -hmm. talked about. I don't think the filibuster goes away entirely, but I think he's willing to do that because he recognizes that if you can break through as we've seen in the past with Medicare Part D, you know, prescription drug expansion with Obamacare, if you can get that big program enacted and people come to be used to it, it's very hard to get rid of it. So, so that's why I see his, his uh, couple of months in office so far. So, Professor, what letter grade would you give Biden for, for the first 100 days? You know, I never tell students how they're doing in the class, uh, <laughs> midterm wise. I just don't. They ask me, and I say, we'll wait and see when, when, when the final is over and the final thing. <laughs> you know, I think he's doing, I think he's doing very well. I mean, I think he, given what he's faced with, uh, I think B, I like to give uh, half grades, so maybe a B, B plus. Okay, thank you. Uh, Professor Lewis. Sorry, um, thanks for inviting me to this discussion. I mean, I don't usually talk about American politics, so this is new for me. Um, I 
believe that he has done, President Biden has done some very important things um, right at the start of his term. Um, I mean, bringing some, his COVID relief bill, I think was absolutely incredible in moving us to the point where we can start to see some semblance of normalcy returning. And I think that that cannot be underestimated. And you know, he deserves as much credit as possible for bringing us to this, this point. But I, I think that if I'm to look at what he has done so far, I think that he has, it's, you know, it's a mixed bag because I think that he is all, he has also missed some important opportunities. And I am wearing the kind of more um, international lens here because even as we, I applaud his, his approach to vaccinating Americans. I, I think his approach to the rest of the world in amassing all of the vaccines that he, he, he could for Americans, way in excess of what Americans needed um, when you know other people can't get vaccinated was very short-sighted and totally unnecessary. And when you compare how his vaccine approach has been in relation to China's, then you see there's a huge gap. And it's not about geopolitics. You know, that's an element of America first that was too resonant of the Trump administration um, as far as I'm concerned. It's about caring about people. It's not even about enlightened self-interest to know that you can't get out of the pandemic if the world is still mired in it. It's just human decency. And I think that that for me was a serious feeling. But having said that, I think that he made some significant strides in reducing um, some of the more egregious policies that, that Trump had, like the Muslim ban, like strengthening protections from DACA, even though that's, that's on the challenge, um, attempting to address migrant children and the conditions under which, you know, they're kept, even though that itself has problems. Um, extending protections for LGBTQI immigrants, very important. And removing restrictions to so illeg legitimate immigration. And of course, stopping construction on that ridiculous wall. So, so I think that those are all um, positive, but he missed this opportunity in really showing a difference, a policy difference by keeping, initially keeping that cap of um, 15,000 people, asylum seekers in place. And I think that's a missed opportunity. But I mean, I think he has done a, a lot in, I mean, recommitting to the Par Paris Climate Agreement to me was a huge deal. Um, rejoining the WHO and uh, coming back to the vaccine, I forgot, he deserves a lot of credit for um, saying that he is in favor of loosening um, IP protections for the production of COVID. And th that's crucial. And hopefully we'll see some concrete action in that regard. And he has tried with justice reform by um, the proposing or getting the jo George Floyd Justice in Policing Act through the House and election reform and voting rights bill. But here I am not as optimistic as Wendy I, I have been reading more than I would normally read for this discussion because when I see things that are unpleasant, I try not to bring them too close. But I've had to confront what the Republicans have been doing um, in their states to make it difficult for people to protest, um, to make it difficult for people to vote. And it seems to me that one of the biggest challenges he has is keeping this country together. And he's not gonna get bipartisan um, support for most of his agenda because most of his agenda is not the agenda of the Republican party. And, I, and he is in a hurry because he doesn't have four years. He has a very short time span within which to get a lot done. So those would be my initial comments. What's his grade so far? 
domestically in an American first way, then he'd probably get B plus. But <laughs> the rest of the world, mm, C plus. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Professor Weir. Sorry about yeah. that. Yeah. So um, I want to focus my initial remarks on uh, Biden's social policy and the big three initiatives, the American Rescue Plan, which has passed, the American Jobs Plan, and the American Families Plan. Nice symmetry in the naming of his big plans. The latter two are the things that are now proposed. And it seems to me that these plans re represent a really remarkable shift in social policy, different from what Republicans have uh, proposed and supported, but also to some extent different from what Democrats have done in recent years. And so mm. I would just flag three things that seem different in these plans to me. And uh, the first one is about uh, issues about deservingness and, and cash benefits. And here the uh, expansion of the child tax credit which he has a, a temporary version in the uh, American, the, the one that passed the American Rescue right. Plan and a somewhat more permanent version in the um, uh, Families Plan. Um, but for the first time, this in, uh, since 1996, this really makes cash benefits available to people who don't have earned income. So it's a big, big support for poor families uh, that has not, uh, been there for the last 25 years. The second thing that I would highlight, and, and you know, they're fighting about this right now, is the idea of recasting social policy as part of basic infrastructure. And there, uh, I think one of the things that I find, you know, really, you know, interesting. Actually, there's a couple of pieces. One is the climate piece of it, but the other piece, and, and that relates to social policy, are the gender. Uh, dimensions of this. So, you know, the American Families Plan has paid family leave, child care expansion, universal pre-K. I mean, these are policies that would bring American social policy to look more like the rest of the developed world. Um, and, uh, but the other thing is including things like uh, boosting the pay of home care workers, uh, recognizing that uh, we really don't have any policies to help people with long-term uh, problems of long-term care. So this whole uh, issue of care. Um, and then finally, it's just the rhetoric about government and taxes. You know, uh, you know, just for a Democrat to come out and say, well, we're gonna raise taxes and just say it and say, you know, they have to pay their fair share, you know, Joe, it's not, none of this has ever was my impression of Joe Biden prior to him actually taking office. Uh, and, um, you know, in his current plan, hire more people to staff the IRS. And this kind of forthright defense of the need uh, for tax revenue for public purposes, you know, Democrats have been afraid to talk about that uh, ever since Reagan. So, so it's really quite striking. And just would say a few things about these kind of stepping back initiative, what these initiatives say to me. In some ways, they say to me, it's kind of a return of the party to its New Deal roots, you know, New Deal 2.0 or something. And that political idea is that you unite the bottom and the middle against the top. Um, and that stands in juxtaposition to the Republicans, you know, makers and takers, you know, that got Mitt Romney in trouble talking about that, but, but that is a very different view of, of your political alliances. And um, so I think that this is a, a version of the political or an attempt to build a political version of the New Deal Alliance, but updating it with a strong gender and care dimension. And I, I do wanna say something also about uh, racial equality. Um, you know, Trump's uh, way of governing was to inflame racial and ethnic divisions primarily. And um, Biden, I would characterize what he has done is, is what some social scientists call targeting within universalism. So you find these big tent policies that a lot of people will like, universal pre-K, mm -hmm. paid family leave, and they disproportionately 
benefit low income people of color, but you do it within this broader tent, this broader coalition. And then I guess finally, and this um, resonates with something that Wendy was saying is that these are big changes, but they're wrapped up in this, come on, man, you know, this every, <laughs> every man kind of thing. This is just common sense. People need help to get their, you know, put their family life together. So it's quite, it's quite striking to me. And, and this also goes to what Wendy was saying is that, you know, there is no tea, tea party, you know, this is big government. There's no tea party like Obama faced. And I think, you know, some of it's due to the disarray in the Republican party and some of it's due to, uh, to but some of it is due, I think, to Biden's like, this is just common sense. This is what American families need. So as you can see, I am gonna give him. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yeah, you know, you know, it's it's interesting what you said about Biden and his personality at, at the end, and building on what Wendy had said. Uh, but I think another th aspect of it is that he's been so disciplined, which was not a part of this was not a part of the Joe Biden that we knew. Quite the opposite. Uh, Professor Brett Schneider. Uh, thanks. Um... Uh, a lot of the, I was going to start with praise, you know, as on the theme of giving students comments, you always start with the praise before you go on to the criticism. So Margaret uh, has done a lot of uh, that, I think, already. I'll just say, you know, I think that this presidency has to be understood in contrast to the other one, which was historic in its crisis, especially at the end. Of course, we're coming off uh, something that has never happened in American history, uh, insurrection to try to stop a vote count in the in a breach of the Capitol. And I think the presidency, especially the first 100 days, has to be understood in contrast to that. And you certainly do have a contrast, first of all, in style. I mean, you have somebody who's getting, as you just heard, an enormous amount done, but without anything like the bombast of the Twitter and the statements and the fighting with journalists and, and done very quietly. In fact, he's being criticized for not speaking to journalists enough and sort of restoring even like a 18th century idea, you know, of, of modesty and restraint. But at the same time, it's coming with a Roosevelt-like uh, aggressive social policy. I mean, that one, uh, just that one instance that Margaret gives of the tax credit, um, the child cr tax credit, the estimate is that if it does become permanent, 50% of child poverty that it'll be halved. I mean, that is epic in its, in its size. Uh, and of course, the amount of funding that we're talking about um, with the T word, trillions is, uh, is you know, $2 trillion. And it, when, when the words like that, I mean, there, it, it, it is also historic in, in, in that accomplishment, I think, and in the recovery and of course, COVID. So I'm on board certainly with the idea that this is in many ways a recovery presidency. So now on to the criticism though. I mean, to me, you know, part of what this has to be about is not just economic recovery, although that's part of it, not just not saying terrible things from the bully pulpit, you know, although that's part of it and restoring a sense of dignity and modesty to the office. But it has to be, I think, to really be a recovery presidency, there has to be an attempt through legislation to fix the flaws that we saw in the presidency itself. So I'll just give a couple of examples and I know some of them will come up in the discussion as well. I worked during the Trump presidency on um, an amicus brief that was not victorious in the Supreme Court but was cited by the dissent saying that Trump's Muslim ban was A, a Muslim ban based in animus towards um, uh, uh, people of Islamic faith and background. And it is right that Joe Biden has reversed that through an executive order, but all that it would take to reinstitute it as another Trump, either Trump himself or, or uh, Tucker Carlson or some other Trump-like figure to reinstitute it, we really need legislation to stop this from happening. And we've seen that we can't trust the Supreme Court to guarantee constitutional rights, especially against anti-Muslim animus. Uh, or, or animus more generally, the court, court upheld it, of course. And so, you know, I want to see put, pushing for that kind of legislation. Now, a bill has passed the House, but you haven't seen Biden really aggressively push for it. Uh, and the same is true in the area, of course, the most pressing area, which I know we'll talk about, of voting rights, that 
Um, uh, yes, there's HR1, uh, uh, there's this alternative weaker form of HR1, uh, but you don't see him out front saying this is the most important threat to our democracy. He's focused on other things. And I think, you know, there is a chance that uh, next time it might not go so smoothly when it comes to an insurrection. It might not be such an incompetent president and things like stopping uh, the vast amount of gerrymandering, the things that you're seeing in Georgia about um, laws to limit bringing food to people waiting in long lines, which of course exist in the first place to dissuade people from voting. Those are structural features that have to be addressed. And then even the most mi minimal thing that the, 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 the bills require is the, over, the reversal of the court's opinion in Shelby County, which took away the Department of Justice oversight in um, basically when localities with a history of discrimination uh, try to flip their rules in order to dissuade people from voting. That's crucial. And yet, you know, uh, there's a possibility that one person in the Senate, as you, many of you know all too well, including you, Rich, the one person in the Senate, Joe Manchin, might be standing in the way. That's not okay. I mean, Biden is the president of the United States. He has to be pushing for these things. And we can talk about more. I'll mention just one more feature which is we talked for four years about the need to stop a president, the need for protection of an independent counsel. Of course, Trump tried to fire uh, Mr. Mueller. He ordered his counsel, Don McGahn, to do it. McGahn just went home and decided that he would just not do it and not bring it up again. And somehow, miraculously, it didn't come up again. Uh, that just shows you, you know, that, that the Nixonian worries of another Saturday Night Massacre of a criminal president we have very little protection. This is the moment to fix that. And I've just heard nothing uh, from Biden, even though there was huge support for a protect Mueller bill or a return to the old independent counsel law passed during the Carter administration in which the person investigating and possibly prosecuting a president wouldn't work for a president. Those are common sense reforms to the office that we've just forgotten about. And uh, I think that's you know really a travesty. So. Um, with all the good, you know, I'm going to give them an A, and with all the bad, I'm going to give them a C. So that winds up with a B. <laughs> uh, Professor Atwood. Yep. You still you still muted, Brian. Well, that shows. I, I was saying that I'm glad you didn't go alphabetically because I've been listening to the others and appreciating their their perceptions of this and and even their grades interesting uh, you know everything in politics is timing and i don't i mean joe biden ran for president twice before and the timing was not right and he was president vice president during an administration that uh, again as we have now a very divided government and and uh, they were very very fortunate to get obamacare through also using reconciliation and not having to uh, confront a Senate that was filibustering against uh, most of what he wanted to do. Um, I think the Obama administration was very successful on the international stage, although that's arguable. And uh, what Biden has done is rather extraordinary. Wendy and Rich, at least, and I all worked in the Senate and we knew Joe Biden, uh, and he, I don't think the word discipline was ever a part of, of uh, our characterization then, but he has run an incredibly disciplined White House, as you said earlier, Rich. And one of the things he's done is to, is to be very somewhat uh, disciplined or uh, secretive even about what the next move would be, because his White House staff has been very disciplined. I give credit to Ron Klain, who's the, the, the chief of staff, uh, but he's basically made a commitment to cabinet government. And he's, he's uh, one of the things that hasn't been mentioned here today is he's put some really outstanding people into these positions. I've known and worked with Tony Blinken over the years. I think he's very, very competent and has the energy to do what he's doing now, which is flying all over the place and going over to Israel to see what can be done to stabilize that situation. Janet Yellen, um, I was very impressed that she not only has uh, decided that she was pers would pursue a global minimum tax on multinational corporations, 
But in order to get to the table, she had to make a concession to the Europeans right off the bat that basically they could tax the profits that were made by the Silicon Valley companies that make a lot, an awful lot of profit in Europe. That's a huge concession. It hasn't got a lot of publicity here, but uh, that's an indication that she, as the former chair of the Fed, has uh, uh, inspired confidence even among Republicans. Uh, if you look at the stock market, I mean, part of that is because people worry about inflation, uh, but she and, and the chair of the, the current chair of the Fed basically have said, look, let's, let's try this. And if this looks like it's going to heat up, then they have some tools to basically put it under control. It's a little more difficult <clears throat> for the administration on the international side. Um, a lot has been done. I think it's, it is, has, the, has the, uh, uh, the possibility of being transformational on the domestic side. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but it's a little more confining uh, on the international side when you consider that you've got to overcome what was done for four years which basically the America, America first policies basically turned our allies into enemies. I mean, uh, and that means basically that they were spending a lot of time just deciding how they could confront the United States. Turning that around is not easy. And uh, I think there's, there's the, all the steps have been taken. We've rejoined the World Health Organization. We've rejoined the Paris uh, Climate uh, Accords. We have, um, Patsy made a good point about vaccines, but if he hadn't gotten that under control here first before reaching out, I think probably uh, he would have been unsuccessful in getting the support he would need to basically have a program to finance through the COVAX system, which he has, has joined uh, the developing countries. He made a very difficult decision on, on uh, IP, on intellectual property. I wrote a column a couple of days before that decision. I know others were weighing in on that as well, but to say that we'd make an exception to intellectual property in order to give countries like India, South Africa, the ability to produce these vaccines themselves, that was a big decision. It may not have an immediate impact, but uh, COVID isn't going away anytime soon. And if it's possible for these vaccines to be produced in places like India, I think it will be a big help in the long run. Uh, so there's an awful lot that has been done on the international uh, side. Uh, no one expected to see what we've seen in Israel with the Palestinians and the Israelis. Although, frankly, maybe the intelligence community did predict it because uh, Netanyahu needed something and so did Hamas. Uh, I won't get into that. Uh, anymore, uh, but except to say that uh, I agree with Tom Friedman that the two of them play off one, of one another uh, very well. And maybe when, uh, as things get worse, uh, we can find a way uh, to pursue a two-state solution once again, although physically on the ground, uh, things are going to have to change. There's a, there's just a, a, a Back to my point about cabinet government, uh, I've never seen so many cabinet uh, officers on television explaining policies, Buttigieg on the infrastructure, uh, Janet Yellen, as I mentioned before, uh, Granholm on energy and, and, and the environment. And there's just a constant uh, uh, message going out, which is what has to be done. I don't know where the infrastructure bill or the so-called American jobs bill is heading. There is an effort. It seems to me a genuine effort to try to get bipartisan support, but to offer a $500 billion cut in what he originally proposed and then have the Republicans say immediately, that's not enough. I just think he's, he's basically describing uh, the US at, at being at an inflection point in history with respect to where we're headed, on, especially on climate, and that he's got to push forward uh, beyond the traditional use of the word infrastructure, which is what the Republicans are talking about. It's the traditional bridges and roads and power plants, possibly. He's got to push to get a, a modern economy, and it seems to me that he's 
he's on the right he's on the right wavelength. Um, I, I think that he may not have four years given the politics and the kind of voter suppression that's going on around the country. That would be a shame, uh, but he may have to use reconciliation once again to get what he needs to get done within this Congress uh, to get that infrastructure bill passed. And I don't think he'll hesitate to do it. He realizes that if you look at the eight years of Obama, the biggest domestic achievement was, was Obamacare, and that happened just because of reconciliation. The Republican Party <clears throat> is not only fighting within itself, it really doesn't have an ideology anymore. <laughs> and that's strange. And so if he can continue to make the case to the American people that these things are needed, for the next 30 years, then he has the potential to be a great president, a, a president who has basically changed the nature of the way we think about economics and even politics. Uh, whether he can unify the nation, um, I think he can unify the people up to a point. I don't think he's gonna be able to bring the Republican party on board on a lot of these issues, but I'd give him an A minus. Well, now, uh, several, several of you touched on the uh, pandemic, the COVID bill, uh, but, you know, the weather's turned nice. We're all feeling a little bit like we're emerging finally from uh, the, the, uh, the darkness of the pandemic. But uh, before we move on, uh, you know, if, if, if we'd asked the question on the day that uh, that uh, the President Biden was inaugurated, on, on what's the one thing on which his uh, administration will rise or fall, uh, we, we probably all would have said, uh, what happens with the pandemic? Mm -hmm. And so uh, what I'm curious is, you know, What's your evaluation? How well has he done with it? Uh, and for that matter, how much credit does his predecessor get for uh, pushing the vaccine ahead, if that's what he did? Anybody want to lead off on that? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on that. I, I think that certainly Trump um, encouraged, pushed uh, the, vac the uh, pharmaceutical companies and encouraged collaboration across pharmaceutical companies uh, and basically committed, you know, billions and billions turning into trillions of dollars of taxpayer dollars to buy those vaccines. Basically, say, you make them, get them done, and we'll buy them from you. So, I mean, I don't think you can say that's not true. I think he had a lot of uh, capable people who we didn't see that much of at, at HHS and some at CDC and the National Institute of Health that, that made all that happen. Uh, I think the distribution plan was a, was a mirage. I mean, I think what we saw was this promise of some great distribution plan once it was ready to go, just turned it, it was evaporated. I mean, I'm not sure why people found that credible to begin with, but I think a lot of us did or hoped to, and it was a disaster. There was no plan, there was no distribution plan. So. I think Biden's accomplishment isn't just getting everybody to agree to get vaccinated. It's taking over what was a non-existent distribution plan and getting that up and running in a couple of weeks, which is phenomenal, even before it was inaugurated, really that transition, taking it over since it was dormant and there was nothing going on and being really aggressive about that. Uh, I think to your point about credit for the vaccine and credit for COVID, you know, in a lot of places, as we know, that didn't have as, as strict lockdown policies, that didn't fights about masking, those voters are not going to give Biden credit because they're, they didn't think it was a big deal to begin with. And they either, you know, decided people get sick, that's it, you know, who cares? But they're not going to give him credit for that in some of those particularly deep, deep red southeastern states. Uh, and so that's sort of, that's the question you ask yourself, what can break through what is, <clears throat> excuse me, a partisan and polarized divide now <clears throat> to the point where, you know, they won't even give them credit for the vaccine or they won't take the vaccine. You know, if you look at the current maps of vaccination in the country, there are three states essentially clustered in the southeast part of the country and two states in the west 
where you know they're pretty low vaccination rates. And in some cases in the West, they didn't have high numbers, but in the Southeast, they've had extraordinarily high numbers, particularly in rural communities and particularly in uh, poor and African-American communities. So, so I think that's the problem also with the federal reach of the vaccine is that you know these are administered by states. You can look at the numbers for Mississippi, for Alabama, um, for Louisiana, a little, some parts of Georgia, and you think that is, that is not getting to the communities that need it. And you know, then therefore the people in those communities can't give Biden credit for that. So, so I think um, I've been surprised. I know voting rights is so essential, obviously, and certainly uh, targeted towards suppressing, in particular the South, the black vote in the South, but also the vaccination challenge in the South has been really extraordinary, particularly among um, poor and rural um, black Americans. So getting that to them I think is something Biden has to push harder on and push those Republican governors in those states to get it done. So there's both a political reason he's not going to get credit, but there's also a reality in some of these communities about the levels of vaccination that are still not where they need to be. Uh, Patsy. Yeah, I'll jump in here to say that I am uncomfortable with giving an individual credit for the creation of vaccines. There was a tremendous amount of international collaboration, especially in academia, um, unprecedented levels of, of, of collaboration to sequence the DNA of the, um, the, the virus. I mean, China gave, was very open initially with its data on, on the thing. So there's a lot of collaboration and a lot of, as, as you mentioned, um, Wendy, a lot of public funds going towards developing these vaccines. So it was a global collective effort. I think we have to give Trump credit for not being act an anti-vaxxer and in actually supporting the development of the vaccine and recognizing how important it is to have access to the vaccine. Even though I think it was um, very much a grab, you know, we must have all kind of approach that I, I don't support. Um, and that brings me to the question of patents that the pharmaceutical companies were not alone. They did not do this on their own. So the idea that they should have protection over it and profits from it, I think is deeply problematic. And it really raises a broader question about IP protection in the WTO, what we allow to be protected, and especially in um, a more globalized world where diseases, as, you, as we have seen, cross borders so quickly. And those of us who are not in the United States and have absolutely no scientific um, ability to create vaccines, to do the kinds of research, or even to prevent the spread of these diseases. I mean, there has to be some responsibility. And I think it's immoral to say that, you know, vaccine companies should have a monopoly on life-saving um, medicines. So that's that's my um, comment. Particularly when the U.S. government and taxpayers paid for a lot of it. Uh, but I just reinforce what Patsy said because, I mean, this has been 20 years in the making of these vaccines. Uh, Walter mm -hmm. Isaacson has a wonderful book out called The Code Breakers, where he talks about uh, how some of this, uh, the DNA structure and the RNA structure uh, was, uh, you know, was developed over time. It's innovation and it was done in academia mainly. Exactly. But if you think about the, the academics that were involved in this, they came from all over the world. They came from all over the world. People shared information. There's one other point I would make too. Uh, when Dr. Jonas Salk uh, created the polio vaccine, he refused to have it patented. He wanted it distributed around the world so that we could defeat uh, that particular disease. And he lived a very uh, simple life most of it uh, throughout his life. He didn't uh, ever become the billionaire that he could have become if he had that patent. I think that's just a wonderful story. Uh, so I, I, I think that you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, and in particular, when there is a pandemic, uh, as opposed to other things, I mean, I do understand the, the need for these companies to make some money off of their research, but 
the real uh, investment needs to be, in, and this is again something Biden has talked about, the real investment has to be in the academic community and in innovation and in research and um, the things that brought us to the point where we are now. So I'm reluctant as well to give Trump credit for that, particularly after uh, he basically uh, considered the, the problem to have gone away in the early days when he could have taken action. Anyway, um, I don't want to be partisan tonight, but I think probably the credit goes to the people who develop these vaccines. Uh, Corey brought up the subject of, uh, of the uh, voting rights bill, HR1 or S1 in the Senate. Lots of Democrats uh, have described that, that legislation as existential for democracy, uh, for, for, for this, for, for, first for, the, for this administration, but secondly, for de democracy itself. And I'm wondering uh, how, you know, how, how much you buy into that kind of language about it, and number one, and number two, what you think the prospects are. Anyone want to jump in first on this? Corey. Jump in on that. Sure. I, I mean, as I started to say, I definitely don't think it's just rhetoric. I think sometimes there are things that the Democrats are saying that are about policy and a disagreement, you know, of a sort of traditional partisan disagreement. And there are many policy issues like that, but this is not one. I mean, it is a, a, about the fundamental structure of a democracy. And I think you we just have to go back a little bit into, into some history to see why the 1965 Voting Rights Act is the subject of Malcolm X's speech, The Ballot or the Bullet. And he was saying, you know, it seems like a radical thing to say. He was saying a very simple thing, which is, look, if you deny people the right to vote based on race, that's not a democracy. That's an illegitimate society. You could call it something else. And he spoke there, you know, on the eve of the, the, the consideration of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Now that that legislation passed and it had a tremendous effect when it came to voting rights throughout the United States, but a huge portion of it, um, one of the most important parts of it, and this is going to get a little technical, was struck down by the Supreme Court in the uh, Shelby County versus Holder. And the part that was struck down involved <laughs> policing localities that had a history of discrimination, and it did in a very particular way. If you were a locality with a history of discrimination, you had to go to the Justice Department, and you had to say, okay, we're gonna change our voting rules. And uh, you know, we want you to approve that this is enhancing, not limiting democracy. So all of these things that you're seeing from states and localities of uh, you know, this ridiculous rule about not allowing people to have um, uh, food or water delivered to them while they're waiting on long lines, uh, you know, slightly more subtly, although not much, if you look into it, uh, the voter ID requirement where there's almost no instance of people using fake IDs in voter fraud. And yet there's legislation that, that requires uh, this, 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 um, this like kind of identification. Uh, those are voter suppression techniques of a kind that were, you know, 1965 thought about, and there was a mechanism for limiting it. Now, when the court came in, you know, and I could give you their argument, it's that basically the formula for who was covered wasn't updated, it was very insulting to um, people to call them racist as a locality when they've improved and weren't racist anymore. And a lot of law professors said, well, this isn't that big a deal, you know, we are past that moment in time, this sort of nonsense about post-racist America. <laughs> and, you know, what you've seen is that's about as far from the truth as is possible, that thing after thing is being done. Uh, that's the minimum. And both bills that I mentioned take, would take care of that. That's, that's what both the John Lewis Act and HR1 would take care of. But there are much more serious, much more serious, equally serious things. Uh, and that's, um, you know, partisan gerrymandering, drawing districts in order to favor Republicans rather than Democrats and trying to create some uh, limit on that. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, there are ways of doing voter suppression that have, uh, of anti-voter suppression that are very simple too, that are in 
um, different versions of these bills, including registration at age 18 automatically. Uh, that is, you know, to me, the simplest thing that we need. So yeah, this is an existential threat to democracy. It really is about the fate of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which as of now is, de is decimated. I would, yeah, Margaret. Yeah, I would also, I would uh, endorse what uh, Corey just said, but also add, you know, some of these bills, like the one in Georgia, I mean, they basically make election results political by giving the legislature the right to intervene at, if it doesn't like what a local election uh, uh, board has decided. And so, I mean, so, so it goes, um, you know, there's kind of mixed academic studies about whether voter ID makes a difference. Um, but what those studies do show is that when you put them all together, they make a difference and they make a difference particularly for uh, black and brown turnout. Um, but, but uh, and I, the other thing that I would just add to this is just this uh, poll that I saw the other day that when Republicans were polled and asked about whether they preferred to change their policies so that they could win elections and be more, more popular or whether they preferred to uh, limit the franchise and who could vote, 47% said they wanted to limit who could vote. So you know, there, this, is, uh, this is a problem for our country. If some one very large part of one party doesn't want to play in democracy, which is you change your position and you try to win votes. Instead, you want to change the rules. Mm -hmm. Patsy. Sorry, Corey Brand, forgive me, I don't remember which one of you raised the question that I think it was Brand. You said that Republicans really don't have an ideology anymore. And I'm wondering if this, if this is really true because um, there's a consistency on key things like whether you want, whether you understand, whether you share a concept of what democracy means, which is expanding the opportunities for people to vote, whether you think that it's, you should put people in jail for exercising the right to protest um, or take down Confederate statues, but at the same time, you are giving people the legal right to run over um, protesters. And there isn't a, 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 an outcry from members of the Republican Party of what is happening in, in Florida and other states. Mm -hmm. So can we legitimately say that there isn't um, a Republican ideology that a way of seeing the world that is particularly, is a cohesive way of seeing the world that, you know, you cannot get bipartisan um, support on most major reform bills that expand people's freedoms, or even bills that provide social relief for people who are poor, a lot of who are, Republic whom are Republicans. And I really think that this idea that there isn't an ideology, maybe we don't recognize the ideology anymore, but I think we need to think about what this Republican party really looks like and really is about. I guess I should clarify, <clears throat> there are Republicans who have an ideology and uh, some of them are very fiscally conservative, obviously, and some of them uh, have some very strong views on these issues that you've just raised, Patsy. The problem, I think, is that I think most people recognize that at least the House of Representatives, the Republicans have uh, come under the, the sway of a, of a cult. I mean, the Trump uh, influence has I, I don't know that Trump has an ideology. I don't think he really cares beyond himself. But many of them have just gone in that direction. Uh, Liz Cheney is a good example of someone who has an ideology, not one that I agree with, but uh, she at least has enough values uh, with respect to democracy that she was able to stand up and look what happened to her. So yeah, it, it's uh, I maybe used the wrong word or maybe... Um, I should have said that they have abandoned the ideology that they used to have, which was 
fiscal conservatism. And uh, in some cases, when I was in the Senate, there were people like Senator Case and Javits that were internationalists. And uh, you don't find too many of them anymore. I'll say on my end, I, you know, I think it was Brian's comments that, that you were thinking of, because for me, I think the motivation behind these state and local laws that I'm talking about, which are, I think, obviously voter suppression laws, is based in a very old fashioned American ideology. And that's of, you know, white supremacy and trying to basically hang on to power and to limit black voting power. I think, you know, I wouldn't say that's all of the Republican party. I think there are some dissenters, but certainly I think, you know, much of it, especially when it comes to this. And then when you have the fact that not one Republican Senator has endorsed either of these bills, uh, you know, why is that? That, that, that is different, I think, than the um, uh, 1960s when you certainly did have a, a pro civil rights Republican wing of the party. And that was essential to passing uh, both pieces of legislation, 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And I think this, you know, the Republican Party has gotten much more so in many ways to be a, a white supremacist party. And when it was reauthorized in the Senate, uh, I, I think it was virtually unanimous when they reauthorized the, uh, the 65 Act. Yeah. I mean, now they have the cover of the court. I think that's the, you know, that helps to say, oh, well, it's unconstitutional. Or actually, it's a, I should actually clarify, it's not that the court said it was unconstitutional. That's the irony. The court said the, the Congress hasn't done its job. They didn't update the formula. They didn't right. rewrite the bill. And yet you have people refusing to do that. And yet at the same time, they're, they're sort of saying, well, it's not my fault that, you know, this part of the bill was struck down. It's, it's a game of, you know, of, uh, of, pass the can or whatever it is and pass the blame. Uh, I want to take a moment to uh, remind our audience that if you have questions, uh, you can type them into the Q&A box and in just a few minutes, we'll take a few uh, questions from the, from the audience. But uh, I wanted to ask the panel, uh, in, when, whenever we uh, uh, measure an administration uh, and uh, uh, progress of our national uh, legislature, uh, always in the background, uh, quite lo looming over it, is, are the uh, coming uh, off year elections. And so, um, uh, at, at, at this point, what do we think about how they factor into uh, the prospect of things going forward? I mean, uh, do the, how, well, how well are the Democrats situated, for example, going into the midterm elections or the Republicans? Well, well, I think, you know, just based on history, the out party typically picks up a few seats in the um, presidential uh, midterm year, meaning there's no presidential election. The Republicans are better at getting their base out typically uh, than the Democrats are in midterm elections, except for 2018 and 2006, when Trump was really a huge mobilizer for the Democrats. But the, so the, the, the bad news for the Democrats is that they're facing big headwinds and they have very small margins of, of control in the House and of course yeah. we know in the Senate. So that's statistically bad for them. What's, what's lurking in the background that's good for them is that the suburban voters that defected from the Republican party in 2018 and typically better educated or better off suburban voters vote in midterm elections at higher rates than people with less education and people who, who live in rural areas. And so in 20, 2010 might be an ex, a little bit of an exception there, but generally speaking, they stayed with the uh, Democratic Party in 2018. And even in 2020, the Republicans made gains in some congressional districts that had open seats um, and were very, where a Democrat had won from a Republican once and was very vulnerable. But generally speaking, most suburban voters voted uh, for Biden. So when you think about holding on, winning a couple of Senate races, the suburban voters 
Uh, I think right now, looking at the Republican Party, I still think that, that it's a pretty frightening prospect for them, only because the rhetoric coming out of the House, as Brian suggests, is not anything we've heard before from mainstream Republicans, um, from people like um, Marjorie Taylor Greene, among others, uh, sort of public infighting, ousting Liz Cheney, the, the specter of Trump. Trump is no more popular now than he was in 2018 or 2020. He lost the election in 2020, and he drove basically the Congress back into the hands of the Democrats in 2018. So if he's the front man, literally, for the Republican Party in 2022, I don't see suburban voters flocking back to the Republicans, which could be just enough to save the Democrats. The two senators uh, who won in Georgia, of course, are both up this time. And uh, given those changes in the voting laws in Georgia, one does have to wonder. I mean, Stacey Abrams is a genius, but whether she can overcome those voting laws is another question. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it looks as though the, uh, there's a good Democratic candidate in Pennsylvania that could be a pickup. But boy, it's going to be really tight. And um, it seems to me your, your point you made, I think that the one person that motivates more Democrats than any other is Donald Trump. And he's going to get out there on the stump again. And so I think that motivational factor will still be present, especially after what they did uh, you know, in the House to Liz Cheney and the like. Uh, but it's really iffy when you consider the margins. Um, and that means probably what I said earlier, Joe Biden needs to get a lot done in these two years. Yeah, and to, uh, to Corey's point in particular about voting rights, also looking at North Carolina with a Democratic governor that won not easily, but not scarily either, won re-election with a fairly tight Republican um, uh, majority I think when you think about North Carolina, you think about uh, that open seat, Richard Burr's open seat. That's gonna be a big bellwether. I think once we see how that's shaping up in the summer and the candidates that emerge that run, I think that's gonna tell us where suburban voters are going. And I think that's gonna tell us whether the impact of Trump is more positive for turnout for Republicans or more negative um, for turnout um, in terms of uh, motivating Democrats. But I think North Carolina, uh, as opposed to Pennsylvania, Ohio, which I think are gonna be very competitive. We'll see what Tim Ryan can do in Ohio for the Democrats. But I think those are gonna be very competitive, but I think the Trump factor is probably gonna be stronger in North Carolina. And that's what I'm really curious to see alongside, they, North Carolina has a very large African-American voting population. So let's see, and they've had voter suppression for a long time under the previous uh, Republican <clears throat> governor. So let's see how that goes and see what those, how those winds are blowing. Um, and I think that's gonna give us a good idea of how the whole national uh, election is gonna go. I think there has to be a massive mobilization um, of people, you know, on the lines that they don't want you to vote. You just have to vote. And there has to be, you know, grassroots organizing to bring people out to vote. And hopefully, the, some of the initiatives on the domestic front might actually have enough of an effect in people's lives that at least Republican voters who may never vote demo, um, Democratic might actually not be motivated to come out and vote. Mm -hmm. But it's going to be challenging. Well, and also uh, in, in many of these uh, uh, red states that we've been talking about, that have been passing uh, voter suppression laws. I mean, th th there's a very good chance that that's going to stimulate. Actually, the the uh, the reaction to it is going to stimulate turnout on the other side. Let's hope so. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Margaret. Yeah, I mean, I I agree that it's it's a knife's edge for the Democrats, but um, it it does you know a lot of what the Biden administration seems to be about so far is we learn the lessons of Obama mm -hmm. and we're gonna do things differently. And yeah. um, you know, from what I've seen, it does seem like they are, you know, trying to do, you know, Obama was so much about policy once he got in and much less about mobilization. And it does seem like the Democratic Party is more focused on it now and they started focusing on it 
earlier. I mean, the thing about massive mobilization is it does take time. I mean, the 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 organizations that were built in Georgia took took ten years, mm -hmm. and so you know, I think kind of trying to understand more about what really mm -hmm. is going on at the grassroots level to build a really reliable turnout machine mm -hmm. is is the other piece of this. Mm -hmm. Is it, it's, I mean, it's interesting what goes into some of these uh, off-year elections uh, it, at the beginning of a new president's term. Is It's not only a reaction from the other side uh, against his policies, but also typically a bit of buyer's remorse uh, within the president's party. And... Uh, you know, are we, are, you know, are we seeing some of those first cracks already in the democratic unity? I think, I, I think there's a difference between the progressive caucus in the house and the people who are most uh, vocal in that caucus and the rank and file Democrats who are going to get out to vote in midterm elections. And remember, mm -hmm. that's the big difference is that the presidential composition of the party and voting electorate is very different from the midterm election. And so the people who would be probably less favorable towards the very progressive wing of the Democratic Party are the ones who are probably going to definitely get out to vote mm -hmm. in the midterm elections, just based on historical voting patterns. Mm -hmm. But that's a problem with the Democrats, because what mobilizes and gets them over the hump for victory are younger people, are uh, previous people who didn't vote before, just as Trump used those people, um, previous people who hadn't voted before in 2016. So they've got a problem. They can't alienate or, or shove aside the very progressive wing of the House because those are the people that can get, as Patsy's saying, really get mobilization, particularly in communities of color. So that is a fine line for Biden to walk. And on foreign policy, as Brian's suggesting, you know, basically, He's done a few things different from Trump, no question about us, got us back into these um, international agreements. But there's a lot of other things that he's doing that are pretty similar to what the Trump administration was doing, just the United States position in general. Certainly getting out of Afghanistan was something was when he first, and he basically got inaugurated that day even before. He said, we're getting out, that's it. Let's just figure out how we're gonna do it and when we're gonna do it. So in terms of Afghanistan, and that's not gonna go well. Uh, of course, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and that's a big divider in the Democratic Party in a way that it is not a divider in the Republican Party. And again, when you're looking at campaign donations and you're looking at people who are more, most likely to vote, that's where, you know, that's where Margaret's point about the big push, the FDR push. Can you tell voters that, yes, give us credit for doing this for you? Yes, we are the party that takes care of you. We are, it is, we are not the other, we are you, you are us. That is something I think the Democrats have lost the art of doing over the last decade. And if they can do it, and Joe Biden's probably the best salesperson to do it, then I think they can squeeze by. But uh, on issues of like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict right now, you're seeing some really nervous Democratic Party leaders thinking, how do we possibly walk this line um, and come out in a positive way on the other side? And that's that's going to be very difficult. And I think I also agree that as long as the two, the principal actors in that conflict remain the same, that conflict will persist. Uh, and Biden's not going to take that on. That is not Biden's mission. Biden's mission is domestic. And so I think that's, that's the, those are the clouds, you, you know, that are, are looming on the horizon for them. It's also the Iran issue and the nuclear deal uh, they, uh, they're being very careful about that because obviously they'll need support in Congress for whatever come, comes out of that. But uh, uh, and Netanyahu, I'm sure, is bending Tony Blinken's ear right now about that Iran nuclear deal. And uh, they've got to pursue it. I mean, I, I think it's just the right policy. But no one wants to act first. I mean, the Iranians don't want to act first until all of the sanctions are removed and the US doesn't want to appear to be acting first without getting some concessions from the Iranians. Europeans are, are being very helpful to us there. But I could, and even the Chinese and the Russians want to see an agreement, uh, want to see a restoration of the agreement and maybe even go further. But still, it, it, these are dicey issues. And um, I don't, I mean, I don't know when the next Israeli election is going to be. But I mean, Netanyahu was on the verge of losing 
Lapid was going to sort of form a coalition and his fellow Bennett was uh, going to join him, but then uh, with this, when this happened, uh, he moved away. And now it looks like they're gonna to have to have another election. And uh, so I think Biden uh, and with respect to the politics of it has been very careful. I mean, and a lot of the progressive have been very, very critical of him for being so careful about this. But I don't, I think if when the full story comes out about his discussions with Netanyahu, I think he really did play a very useful role in finally getting uh, a ceasefire in this. But I don't know that until you get a change of leadership on both the Palestinian side and the Israeli side, I don't see moving it beyond where it is today. I do think there's a, <clears throat> there it's, it's a difficulty when um, your first response is Israel has a right to defend itself as a knee-jerk reaction without actually um, taking a considered view of what was happening, recognizing that there's a huge imbalance of power between um, Israel and Palestine, and that um, these are still occupied territories where the occupying force has responsibilities to the occupied under international law. And I think not to think about those things in a context when the, the deaths and the, and the suffering from the violence is disproportionately um, against the Palestinians. To then say Israel has a right to defend itself, to me is deeply, hugely problematic. As is the position on Cuba, as is the position on Venezuela, and I can go on, but <laughs> I'll stop here. We're hearing from the progressive wing. <laughs> well, there is one in the house. That's great. <laughs> oh. Okay, we've we've been promising the audience that we'll take a few questions, and so it's really time to do that. And uh, uh, Kevin asks, uh, "What kind of job do you think President Biden has done working with Senators Manchin and Cinema?" given the importance reconciliation is, like, is going to play in the next two years, are concessions on proposals really geared towards them? Well, well uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Manchin's up for re-election, so that's mm -hmm. the big uh, problem. Cinema's not. So I think that's one of the concerns, and Manchin's playing that to the hilt. And um, you know, you can't just target everything towards them. But if you think about West Virginia and you think about Arizona, there are a lot of things that they cover as individual states that Biden can address, right? So Arizona has all sorts of border control, obviously, but also climate issues and water issues. And it is turning a little bit more purple. Uh, and certainly a lot of Latino voters West Virginia cares about healthcare. They care about the jobs, as, as you said, Brian, uh, the, the more modern economy, uh, for example, how to build that because West Virginia cannot rely on coal, as we know, they're sort of shutting down those mines and um, they just need jobs and they need job training. And they've, they've siphoned a lot under um, the late Robert Byrd back to West Virginia in terms of federal employment, but that's not gonna sustain them. So economic development is something that can play in West Virginia and Joe Manchin can sell that in West Virginia. And at the same time, Biden can talk about a more humane refugee immigration, particularly border control policy in Arizona. He's not gonna get the Trump voters in Arizona, but he may keep the people who voted um, for Mark Kelly, for example, who's up for reelection in Arizona in 2022. So there are ways that those two states, just by virtue of the issues that they raise, actually give Biden some room to appeal to that coalition that elected him and try to keep that coalition in the Democratic fold particularly if we're talking about an infrastructure bill. I mean, nothing is more traditional than using public works as a lever to uh, build, you know, build your majority. Anyone else on that? Uh, Margaret. I don't have anything to say about those two uh, senators in particular, but one um, thing that I think and maybe has some some repercussions for that, that I think that has been interesting 
that Biden has done is to try to go uh, below uh, the federal level and to um, appeal to mayors and people who actually mm -hmm. have to do stuff and make yes. stuff happen. And so I think that, you know, and that could be something that then goes around back up to help him in a lot of ways that, you know, I mean, he's emphasized that there are Republicans who support what we're doing. They, they're just mayors. And mm -hmm. so I think in, in, in a number of states that that, that that strategy and particularly with regard to infrastructure might help them a long time ago and his infrastructure will be probably be good. I was on a panel with the mayor of Riverside after Obama's um, stimulus passed and he said, we had no ribbons to cut. <laughs> and, you know, I think that, um, you know, I think the goal here is to, is to give people some ribbons to cut and, um, and take credit for it. Why the, that's why the Congress has gone back to earmarks. Mm. Yeah. Can I just add here that I think that one of the things that he has to be that he has to be given credit for is the focus on workers and bringing back workers' protections and trade unions. And in that sense, I think that his approach to trade, which we have already discussed, I do not have a problem with thinking carefully about how you um, find ways to protect people's jobs or as he did, which I think was very clever to bring into the infrastructure plan, a whole slew of activities that are climate um, related as a way of expanding the economy, expanding jobs for people. And you know that generates um, jobs internally. So I think that that's a huge plus that you know we haven't really discussed. Right. He's he's uh, accused, of course, of being a socialist, but he's using middle class and workers' language. I mean, and and that is what he is. I mean, let's face it; he's not a he's, he's not a European socialist. I mean, whatever that means in the context of American politics, but but he's uh, he, he identifies with working people. And that is very helpful because frankly, because of the Reagan revolution, Democrats lost a lot of those, those voters. They went to the other side. Um, I, I, think, I think one of the things when we look back on this that will be amazing is how progressive he was in terms of policies and really left when you think of the amount of money spent. And when you think too of the targeting of that tax credit, I mean, if that succeeds, having one half of the current rate of child poverty, that's historic. I mean, the only mm -hmm. thing that compares, you know, is the Great Society and the New, New Deal in terms of the numbers of reducing poverty. And yet it's not done anything in the way that either FDR or Linda Johnson did. I mean, Johnson had a whole, you know, ideology, a whole structure of thinking that went along with these programs. And yet what's remarkable about this is it's just done on the quiet, you know, through legislation, deliberately boring legislation, tax credits doesn't get front page coverage in the same right. way that huge speeches do. And yet the impact is monumental if this turns permanent rather than temporary, which I think it might. The other thing that he's done is he's worked very uh, well, quietly, uh, you know, on, on these on these programs, on these infrastructure programs. Uh, Margaret mentioned with local officials, but also on Capitol Hill, because he knows he's got the air cover of reconciliation behind him, and that ultimately, if pushed to the wall. Uh, he's going to get an infrastructure bill. He's going to find. He's going to. He's going to close a deal with Mansion, and he's going to have a bill. And uh, thanks to the interpretation of the uh, Senate parliamentarian, they may. We may see two reconciliation bills before the year is out. Uh, the clock is ticking on all of that, of course. Uh, but I think. I think he. Uh, you know, I, I really think he would prefer to, to find a, a bipartisan solution uh, through this. 
Now, I like the point too that you know we might see a lot of really nice airports and bridges in West Virginia. There's a traditional way <laughs> to get that bill through, and we all know what it is. Yeah. Now, I mean, one thing I guess I think just going back to to kind of combine topics is. Why is there not more of a push on the civil rights, on the voting rights legislation specifically? I mean, there's nothing about that maneuver that he's using in infrastructure that couldn't also bleed over and, as part of the deal. But I just, I mean, who knows what's going on behind the scenes, but the, I think that's the obligation of the president right now, as much as to end COVID, is to protect the democracy. And yet I'm not it's not that he's not endorsing it, but he's not putting his weight in the way that, that he is, I think, for these other things. And I think that's that's a shame. Well, I think I think part of the problem, Rich can correct me, is that if you keep the public financing part uh, in these bills, you could make an argument about taxes. Um, but reconciliation is really a budget bill. So if you don't have a direct impact on the budget, particularly through revenue, um, it's pretty hard to make the argument. But, you know, I'll leave that to Rich to... To <laughs> confirm, but that's a harder yeah. argument to make. You mean on civil rights, on voting, on the voting yeah, rights bill. Voting rights, yeah. yeah. To use reconciliation. Yeah, I mean the technique would be different, but he's the president of the United States. You could rally America behind this, or the party behind the bill, and put pressure on this one person. And so I think that you know you're able to do it in infrastructure because there's creativity, and the techniques will be different, of course. The offers will be different, but do what it takes to get that one vote. And that might not just be a bridge. It might be something even more drastic, but whatever it, it needs to be, I think that's, we're, we're not seeing that. We're not seeing the same devotion to the Voting Rights Act. He's not talking about it on the, um, you know, from the bully pulpit. He's not having press conferences about it. And I think the unfortunate reality is that it's just less of a priority for this administration than, than infrastructure and COVID. And, you know, that's a choice maybe that lines up with the way he was elected, but it's a, a really mistake long-term because to me, as important as those things are, you know, if, if you don't fix the democracy and those two seats, by the way, you know, were so precariously won, it's all gone. And, uh, you know, we're in a different world in two years. I would just disagree with you that it isn't a priority, Corey. I mean, it did pass, HR1 passed yeah. the House. But it is it is almost um, the, the Republicans will be absolutely united on this one. And it's very difficult to figure out. You can't hard to use figure out how to use reconciliation for something like that. That's that's the problem. Well, the proposal that that the um, that um, uh, Warnock has made, which to me is exactly right. And, you know, the Democrats are resisting it. And I know Rich will disagree, might disagree with this, but is not to get rid of the filibuster, but is to get rid of uh, the filibuster in regard to civil rights and and civil and, and politics. And when it comes to the fundamentals of the democracy and part of the argument that Senator Warnock is making is that when you look at the history of the filibuster, its most pernicious use is in regard to filibustering civil rights legislation. So what better way to rectify that historical wrong than not to get rid of it entirely, that's a different issue, but to get rid of it in this one area. And if you look at what the Republicans did, of course, and when it came to, 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 to Article Three nominations, they were also willing to get rid of it in one area. And so I think, you know, that kind of aggression is precisely what's needed here. And it could happen. The, the person, by the way, that's responsible for this uh, is the chair of the Rules Committee, Amy Klobuchar, and she's very clever. Yeah. She had, I think, an eight to eight vote in committee. Now they have to figure out how to get it to the floor. and. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see something like that happen. Well, and, and we want to be clear, as Rich would also want to do, that we're not getting rid of the filibuster. Nobody's getting rid of the filibuster. You're just lowering the threshold from 60 votes to 51. So, and in, the, in this one area, that's the other proposal, that right. civil I mean, rights would be different. Right. So right. it's just that you would only have, the problem is you still need 51 votes. And right, right. now, Biden doesn't yeah. even have that. And so if you're thinking, if you're Biden, and you're thinking, I want to get all these things done, I don't have, I may only have two years to do it. I have to make choices. And I don't disagree with you that it's um, short-sighted not to recognize that Voting Rights Act will make a big difference in key states. But he's got next year too. And that's an election year where people are, are registering to vote. They're lining up to vote. They're yeah. doing those campaign commercials. There might be a much stronger public, ad, public appetite to be mobilized on voting rights when they're thinking about an election. 
Um, now right. it would be lost, I think, in the COVID fog. No pun intended to those people who are suffering from that. I'm just saying that the no. people are just hoping to get out of the COVID pandemic and to try to mobilize them now, I think may not work. So I'm not, I agree with Brian. I don't think it's gone. I don't think it's dead. Mm. I think they're trying to figure out what the timing should be. And I think when you're going to vote next year, you're going to wonder why you can't register. Yeah. I mean, I always try to leave room when I grade for, you know, an increase at the end. And that's what I'm hoping to see. But that deadline is not four years. It's, I think it's oh, yeah. two. Right. <laughs> yeah. There may be right. some, you know, I mean, you mentioned at the outset, the, the, uh, the Lewis bill, which of course, you know, yeah. it, is kind of a subset of the voting right. rights, uh, the right. voting rights bill. So there's some room there to contract. I mean, right. you know, you don't have to you don't have to take on every issue all at once. Right. Know? There might be some third thing. So, you know, yeah. the old the old saw about not making the perfect the enemy of the good. Yeah. Right. Uh, I think one last question from the audience and. Uh, 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 this is from our, uh, actually from our colleague, Bill Allen. Uh, and I, he asks a, a good question. He says, I'd welcome comment on uh, Vice President Kamala Harris's first 100 days. I think that's a good place to uh, maybe make our closing arguments. She's been given responsibility for uh, Central America relief package, which is a $4 billion effort uh, there. And that's a tough one. Uh, I think she's done very well. It's, I, I have to say something though, there's an image issue that I have. Joe Biden used to stand behind uh, Barack Obama and most vice presidents do, but I get uncomfortable seeing Kamala Harris standing behind Joe Biden. I'm, I just, that's, that's an image thing. I, I don't like it. Maybe some other women on the panel would agree with me. <laughs> I, I certainly won't disagree. <laughs> I, I, I don't have a problem with it. I think it's, you know, she's vice president, not president, quote unquote, yet. So um, my bigger thing, I'll be really quick so Corey can jump in, is that I'm not thrilled with the way that he's sort of given her responsibilities. I mean, I'm still going back to the Walter Mondale Mon, you know, memo about what you do with a vice president that changed Carter's mind. But even Al Gore had, you know, reinventing government, uh, you know, and Biden himself, not, not until 2012 really was given AFPAC, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iraq. So I understand the time lag, but I think he's given her a really difficult task and then nothing else. So my issue is not so much where she's standing next to him, it's <laughs> what's her portfolio and give her a much more visible presence yeah. and that that I have right. yet to see. Right. I just say she's the 51st vote in that, you know, on that Voting Rights Act. And to me, that suggests a place for her portfolio, which is to take a lead in making the case to the American people about what the history is here, what this is about, why it's so important, and to make the case to bring it to the Senate, to Joe Manchin. <laughs> and, and, you know, I think that I can't think of a, a huger role. And the other reason why she would be, you know, Joe Biden's not a lawyer. She is a masterful, has masterful knowledge of the issue as, you know, attorney general of California and could really, I think both, you know, not only knows the issue, but could, could explain it to people in a way that would really make the case. And I, that would be great if that's what happens a, a few months from now. I agree with Wendy. I, I don't feel her. I think that I feel like she doesn't really have a role. And then she is landed with Central America, which is uh, migration, which is a big problem to solve. And when the U.S. is not speaking to two of the governments in power, <laughs> I, I think it's it's a bit um, challenging. But, you know, maybe she can do something with it. Let's see. I'll just I'll say that I'm basically happy to see her there. Yes. So, and uh, and we'll see. She's a skillful politician. Right. And uh, I bet her role will be changing over time. Yeah, there there's room to grow, so to speak, uh, in terms of that in terms of that role, and uh, I, you know I, I I really suspect we'll see that. 
I think I think Margaret's right. Well, on that note, I want to thank you all for uh, a really uh, interesting discussion. Uh, I know we could do this for another another several hours, uh, but uh, uh, we'll resist the temptation. And I want <laughs> I want to thank our audience for joining us tonight, and uh, we'll uh, see you all down the road. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Bye.